The Lord be with you. Greetings in the name of Jesus Christ. We are grateful for your presence this morning. And um, we say this each week that we gather. Um, but this goes for whether you're in the sanctuary or whether you happen to be worshiping uh, remotely uh, through our YouTube connection. On the inside right page, or what's page three of the bulletin insert, there's a paragraph that starts new members, and another paragraph that starts children in worship. And, and those paragraphs simply say to us that if you are visiting in the sanctuary or worshiping remotely, uh, whether it's in real time or whether you pick it up on the, the YouTube posting later, uh, we welcome you and we are a community of faith in Jesus Christ and people who understand that we are both different and similar in our faith journeys. So we welcome any inquiries about what it would mean to be a part of First Presbyterian Church, whether you formally join or, or do not ever formally join. We understand ourselves to be working together as God leads us as disciples of Jesus Christ. So Encourage others, if you're already a member here, or if you're not a member, be in touch with Emily or Ted. Our uh, emails uh, to connect with us are listed in that paragraph, and we would be uh, very pleased to hear from you for a, a conversation at, at your convenience and at ours, whether it's uh, over coffee or over a meal or over the telephone or in person. So... Uh, Please know that we, we, we extend that welcome to each other. There is, uh, in terms of upcoming events, there is a, uh, an insert in your uh, bulletin, if you're in the room, about the Still Rolling Stone Best Friend. This is uh, an a cappella group from Lubbock Christian University. Uh, we kind of... Uh, became the recipients of an inquiry and a few uh, weeks ago, and this group will be here in the sanctuary tomorrow night at 7. Uh, you know, if it's from a Church of Christ group, they're not going to need the organ or the piano. Um, and they do this with the, with the gifts God has given them uh, straight into their bodies. And so this will be a great uh, concert if you have opportunity to be here. Thirdly, in the bulletin as well, there's a little paragraph about Pentecost, a Pentecost banner being constructed by you all and us all, um, we all, I guess. Uh, I didn't bring my ribbon, but uh, Emily has a basket of ribbons and markers out there, and the way this works is you can fill it out before you leave today, you can take it home with you, and bring it back during the week or next Sunday, and you can have one more opportunity next Sunday to fill it out here in the building. But uh, those will be put together on Monday of uh, eight days from uh, tomorrow. And so uh, there's no time week after next to be uh, too late with that or tardy. Uh, but, um, but those will be put together a week from Monday, and so, if you're interested, it's a great community effort to celebrate Pentecost, and we would love to have as many ribbons from as many people as uh, we can do. Emily, did that go okay? Scripture, prayer, are a blessing. Okay, that says it in the paragraph there, I think, so... Uh, what they want on those ribbons, yes, that's probably a good thing. And uh, Emily will be back there to give guidance after the service today. A scripture, a prayer, or a blessing. And finally, if you, if you go down 31st Street, you will note that the first phase of our garden project is now uh, on the yard, at just going south past the playground area for the preschool. Uh, Boy Scout Troop 976 and uh, Eagle Scout candidate 
Aaron Durham made uh, their project under the umbrella of oversight of our property committee. Uh, so there are four small garden boxes that are on the yard there, and if you are interested in that, we're working to put together a, uh, a garden uh, cooperation committee. And um, uh, so let us know if that's something that interests you about how we will coordinate the use of those boxes from people younger to older. Friends, we are God's people. And with others of God's people, we are invited to be gathered in worship that we might be led to go forth in service. Again, this morning, we are worshiping in the spirit of Jesus Christ with God's people near and far. Thanks be to God. morning. I'm privileged to have the flowers in memory of my mother this morning on Mother's Day, and I wish all of you a happy Mother's Day this morning. Psalm 30 begins with these words, O Lord my God, I cried to you for help, and you have healed me. You have brought up my soul from the depths and restored me to life. I will give thanks to you forever. Would you join us please in singing, Standing on the Promises, you can't do that seated, so the Matthews just popped up back there. So let's stand and please sing together, Standing on the Promises. Friends, 
Let us pray together the prayer found in your bulletin, the prayer of confession. Let us pray. O source of love with compassion and author of justice with mercy, we humbly ask of you what we do not deserve and cannot earn, your forgiveness of our sin, failings, and transgressions in relation to you and other persons. Lead and shape us for trusting you. Grant that we become, with all others, the people you desire and intend for us to be, those who grow as grace-changed disciples and glad stewards of yours in the way and spirit of Jesus Christ. May it be so, both today and always. Amen. Friends, with confidence in the steadfast and abiding love of God, known fully in the one who is the great shepherd of the sheep, let us hear and share with gladness the blessed news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Would you stand? Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Let us hear God's word, reading from the book of 2 Kings, chapter 4, verses 8 through 20 and 32 through 37. Listen now for the word of the Lord. One day, Elisha was passing through Shunem, where a wealthy woman lived who urged him to have a meal. So whenever he passed that way, he would stop there for a meal. She said to her husband, Look, I am sure that this man who regularly passes our way is a holy man of God. Let us make a small roof chamber with walls and put there for him a bed, a table, a chair, and a lamp so that he can stay there whenever he comes to us. One day when he came there, he went up to the chamber and lay down there. He said to his servant Gehazi, Call the Shunammite woman. When he had called her, she stood before him. He said to him, Say to her, Since you have taken all this trouble for us, what may be done for you? Would you have a word spoken on your behalf to the king or to the commander of an army? She answered, I live among my own people. He said, What then may be done for her? Gehazi answered, Well, she has no son and her husband is old. He said, Call her. When he had called her, she stood at the door. He said, At this season, in due time, you shall embrace a son. She replied, No, my lord, O oh, man of God, do not deceive your servant. The woman conceived and bore a son at that season in due time, as Elisha had declared to her. When the child was older, he went out one day to his father among the reapers. He complained to his father, Oh, my head, my head! The father said to his servant, Carry him to his mother. He carried him and brought him up to his mother. The child sat on her lap until noon, and he died. She went up and laid him on the bed of the man of God, closed the door on him, and left. When Elisha came into the house, he saw the child lying dead on his bed. So he went in, closed the door, on the two of them, and he prayed to the Lord. 
Then he got up on the bed and lay upon the child, putting his mouth upon his mouth, his eyes upon his eyes, his hands upon his hands. And while he lay bent over him, the flesh of the child became warm. He got down, walked once to and fro in the room, and then got up again and bent over him. The child sneezed seven times, and the child opened his eyes. Elisha summoned Gehazi and said, Call the Shunammite woman. So he called to her, and when she came to him, he said, Take your son. She came and fell at his feet, bowing to the ground. Then she took her son and left. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I knew I was going to do this one day, and I did it today. Because I write my notes on the back of this yellow pad for the announcements, or the yellow uh, slip of paper in your bulletin, uh, I got absorbed in reading my notes and forgot to tell you that this is our way of knowing that you are here during the season of COVID. So some of you who've been with us several weeks already know that, but if you if you have opportunity to write your name on the yellow slip of paper and simply leave it in your pew, that is helpful. Our ushers will pick those up at the close of the worship service. And you also can place them in the offering boxes since we are not passing offering plates. And those are found at each entrance down here to the front, the side entrances and exit, and also in, in the narthex as you go out toward 31st Street. Thinking back, I first learned of death's reality at the family breakfast table in the county seat town of about 4,500 people where I grew up. My mother was a registered nurse at the local 30-bed hospital. And from 1957 until 1969, her usual shift in those years was the 11 to 7, 11 p.m. to 7 a.m. shift, what, what I used to call the graveyard shift, which meant that she arrived at the hospital about 10.40. She would leave the house about 10.30, get to the hospital at 10.40 for their shift change meeting, and then she would arrive back home at about 7.30 or 7.40 after the shift change meeting where she was handing off and, and leaving the hospital. At 7.30, my dad had the three of us children finishing up uh, breakfast, and routinely my mother would enter the house and she would go over to the uh, refrigerator or the breakfast bar and she would pour herself a glass of orange juice or a cup of coffee and she would come and sit down at the table with us. On this particular morning, Sometime 1963 or 1964, I was in the fifth or sixth grade. There was a morning when she slid into her chair at the table and did not say anything. And her face was sort of grayish white in color. And, and one of us said, uh, my sister or my brother, or I, you look very tired. And she replied, I am. We worked very hard since 5.30 this morning to save a person's life, and we could not do it. Before I graduated from high school, this would happen at least twice more. After that first time, however, when our mother's face was grayish white as she sat down at the breakfast table after a night at work, we kids knew any time after that those signs and what might be the cause, which is why I say I first learned of death's reality at the family breakfast table. Uh, in a different way, when I was in first grade, I learned that there was a girl in the fourth grade, three years ahead of me, whose name was Cherry, which was my mother's first name. Besides my mother, I did not know anyone by that name. So when I came home from school and said to her, 
Someone told me that there is a girl in the fourth grade whose first name is Cherry. Did you know that? She said, yes, when she was born at the hospital, I was helping the doctor, and her parents gave her the same first name that I have. Well, four years later, in August of 1963, when I was in the fifth grade, our school experienced what was called desegregation, consolidating uh, two districts into one from black and white into one with all students together. And in my elementary school, desegregation seemed smooth. It was a sort of adventure with new students, most of us, had not known before, and um, you know, we went to school together that year, and in the ensuing spring and summer, we played little league ball together, and etc. My sister was a year younger, so she was in the fourth grade, and one day, not long after school had started there in the fall of 1963, she came home and said, Mother, there's a a girl in my class whose first name is Cherry, and she has a younger sister in the third grade whose name is Charlene. Isn't that your name, Cherry Charlene? And how did those students get your names? And do you know that they are black? My mother's answer was the same as it had been for me four years before, almost. She said, when Cherry was born at the hospital, I was helping the doctor, and her parents gave her the same first name that I have. I don't remember if I helped when Charlene was born, but her parents named her with my middle name anyway. Oh, my sister and I said, neither of us at the time, of course, really knowing what it's like to think up names for babies at birth. And and that was, of course, in the time when you had to have two names ready but in case it was a boy or a girl uh, because you didn't have advance notice. So I first learned of death's reality at the family breakfast table, but I also learned in my house about positive community relationships of people accepting and caring for and supporting other people, often during crisis, and sometimes during a time of joy. I learned that at school, after school, at home, at church, in town, and out in the country. In the Benjamin West painting of 2 Kings 4, verses 36 and 37, and this is on the cover of your bulletin in in the sanctuary today, it illustrates a mother taking her resuscitated son from what I call a bed and breakfast room as Emily helped us to read and hear from Second Kings uh, this man and woman so often hosted the prophet Elisha and his lieutenant Gehazi that they decided they would add on a room to their house and uh, I call it the bed and breakfast room So that's where Elisha and Gehazi stayed when they came through the area. And so when the crisis develops about this young son being ill to death, she leaves him in that room and goes and fetches Elisha to come and fix this deal, she hopes. And so the picture we have from Benjamin West as he paints it, is of the results of Elisha's best efforts at resuscitation to bring the child back to life, uh, of the mother uh, reaching down to take the child, and and I suspect that is Elisha's lieutenant Gehazi standing behind him in the uh, right background of the painting. Let's go back before that scene, though. A day and a half... Before this, the mother left her son in that room, not breathing. And then she rode to wherever Elisha and his assistant Gehazi were staying, some miles away. She was a determined woman and mother, and she went even though her husband advised her not to go. 
And when Elisha, who, for all I know, Elisha was an introvert. He didn't like uh, uh, drop-in appointments. And so he sees her coming, and he sends Gehazi out to meet her. And she goes right past Gehazi because she only wants to talk to the guy in charge. And so she goes past Gehazi, and she stands before Elisha, None, in none of this was she smiling. Uh, she's a woman of great resolve and intent right now because this is a very serious matter. And she says to Elisha, Look, I never asked you for a son. All I ever was to you was hospitable. And you and Gehazi thought I needed a son. And yes, I have loved him. But now a physical affliction seems to have killed him, and I need you to get to Shunem and see what you can do to fix this travesty. Well, Elisha agrees to go. He was disturbed and moved, but he was not upbeat either. And once Gehazi and Elisha arrive at the bed and breakfast, Elisha ends up in the room with the boy alone and the scripture details his movements and his praying and his worrying and his prayers and his efforts at resuscitation revive and stabilize the child. The determined mother comes back in. She receives her son as Benjamin West's painting shows. And she respectfully and gratefully bows to Elisha, but she never utters a word as the story is told. She is relieved, but she goes straight out the room, no words exchanged. And then Elisha and Gehazi depart, and for all we know, they said nothing either. They might have nodded with respect to the father and mother and son. But that day, no one was upbeat, not even in the celebration of the sons being revived. And yet, each one acted out of deep respect for the other. Deep respect which had been alive among them and which was still alive among them by the Spirit of God in their relationships because each one knew how in life we cross paths, we end up in ditches. And amazingly, even when we are in need of assistance in different ways, we show up for each other. Not always, but sometimes. Sometimes the outcome of a battle between death and life has death winning. And sometimes life wins to continue longer. In 1984, I had been pastor of First Presbyterian Church in Henderson, Texas for less than a year, and the, we came in July, so as Lent rolled around the next February and March, one of the scriptures suggested for worship was John chapter 11, which is the story of Jesus raising Lazarus after Lazarus had been declared dead and buried. I don't remember the sermon that I preached, but I remember after worship, what Dr. John Hillen Sr., a local dentist and choir member and session elder, asked me. Leaving the church that day, he said, Do you know the legend of Lazarus after he was raised by Jesus? And I said, I'd known Dr. Hillen for a, a few months, and so I knew there was probably no easy answer here. I said, in terms of discipleship, 
Uh, some traditions say that Lazarus became a church bishop in the Mediterranean area. And Dr. Helen Sr. said, that is the legend of his service. But the legend of his attitude is that he asked Jesus if his being raised meant that he would never face death again. And Jesus told him, no, you will yet face death death again, and death will prevail on that occasion in terms of life as you know it. There will be no coming back to life as this time. And Dr. Helen Sr. then added, and it is said that from that point, Lazarus never smiled again. Pastor, he said, that is the legend of Lazarus' attitude. The Shunammite woman took her son and departed with no chattiness and no celebration, no high fives, no back slapping. She nodded to Elisha and she went past. Her son had been given more days, maybe even many more years. That is to celebrate. But on some occasion in the future, his earthly days would end, just as his mother's days would end, and just as Lazarus' days would end, and just as yours and mine end. And Elisha and Gehazi, due to their sense of gratitude, to the husband and wife, we look at these two guys and we know that they once prayed for the woman to have a son, promising her that God would give her a son into her life. She was not excited, but later she would fall in love and she could not stand the thought of having her heart broken. Don't we understand that? Elisha and Gehazi meant well, but meaning well is risky with no guarantee of long-standing positive outcome. So a Shunammite mother and son and father grew in loving one another and, and their extended community grew in love with them. Still, a crisis arose in their lives one day, and death was lurking. Death and its early signs, uh, we could call, as, as people refer to a robin as the harbinger of spring, um, a harbinger meaning what anticipates that which is about to happen. Death and its harbinger experiences, we might say, always rank number four, I think, to the sacred triangle of respect, gratitude, and reciprocity. Those three always rank ahead of death in the sacred order of life. Integrity or wholeness is a triangle of respect for others, gratitude to others and to God, and reciprocity or sharing on days glad and on days grief filled. When giving exceeds receiving and when receiving exceeds giving. Death is always the least when compared to that threesome of respect, gratitude, and reciprocity. And yet, death, number four, is always lurking. There's no avoiding that reality. But who, friends, should want ever to avoid respect, gratitude, and and reciprocity. No one. 
because they are the essence of who we are in the power of God's love. I first learned from my mother about death at the family breakfast table and how it lurks and how there is a struggle between life and death in the midst of life. I, I wouldn't always see that, couldn't as a child see it like adults do most of the time. But I learned it at that breakfast table. But I also learned about respect, gratitude, and reciprocity in the larger community from my mother and my father, from people of all ages and all shades of skin pigmentation. I learned it from Presbyterians and Methodists and Baptists and Catholics and agnostics, and later in life would learn it from Jews and Muslims, etc. Like that Shunammite mother. We are not always happy and cheery in our moods. But God is continually blessing people for positive community relationships, for supporting other people, often when in crisis and sometimes when in joy and gladness. And you might learn that at the breakfast table or at school, after school, at home, at church, in town, out in the country, even when death is lurking, as it always is, integrity's triangle is God's greater gift, always alive. Respect and gratitude and reciprocity. All honor and praise be to God. Would you join as we sing together now? Thank we all our God. Would you stand as we sing? Friends, let us once again come together in prayer. 
O Holy One, eternal in your being, gracious and awesome in your appearing, with women and men, boys and girls of every time and place, we gather before you, giving thanks and praise for all that is life in your name. Receive our gratitude for your call to faith, which is so much more than a warm feeling deep within, and so much more like your beckoning to prophets of old, leading them and us to follow where you lead, challenging them and us to risk losing ourselves, and assuring them and us that we will be found again and again in your great mercy and fellowship. On this particular day, we give you thanks for all who are mothers, daughters, nieces, aunts, sisters. Not a single one of us as your people is ever perfect, yet each of us and all of us are created from your love and redeemed by your love. We also bow before you, O God, with deep joy and reverence for Jesus the Christ, who befriends all sinners and breaks down every wall that alienates and divides. We humbly ask for your wisdom and guidance and for your compassion, integrity, generosity, and perseverance to meet the challenges that we encounter day by day. Lift up all who mourn and are cast down. Bring crucial resources to those who experience less than basic means and essentials, including to your people in India and other nations, where disease, social divisions, and poverty expand desperation and suffering. As we trust ourselves and this, your world, to your unfailing care, once again, hear us praying from the words that Jesus taught, saying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. We are marching in the light of God. We are praying in the light of God. And we are serving in the light of God. Would you stand as we sing together? As we go out today, let us go out with thanks and gratitude. 
for all of those who have been sturdy mothers in our lives, whatever role that they have filled to be that person to us, to uplift us in our ugliest of moments, and to yet help us maintain our integrity through this life. Lord, we give you thanks for our mothers. We give you thanks for this life. Let us go out in love. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.